All right. Um, hello and happy Climate Action Week. Thanks for joining us this evening to talk about something quite close to my heart, teaching climate change. Climate literacy is something I've been working on for close to a decade now, um, and I'm really delighted to be joined by two women whose research and careers I've admired for years, Dr. Kleena Murphy and Dr. Anne Dolan. So we're going to start with a quick overview of each of our panelists so you're aware of their different areas of interest um, and then I'll start the panel with a few questions I've prepared but you can please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask questions um, and maybe keep the chat box for comments on what we're discussing. So first up we have Dr. Kleena Murphy, she's a former primary school teacher and has been lecturing in the area of science education for over 20 years. She's developed and implemented a range of undergrad, postgrad and professional learning programs in science and STEM education. She's published research and developed educational resources in science education in the areas of nature of science, inquiry based science education, education for sustainability and climate change education. She's led and collaborated on numerous national and international research projects and is currently principal investigator and co-investigator on a number of national and international projects in science education, STEM ed and climate change education. Kleena's current roles include director of the Centre for the Advancement of STEM Teaching and Learning or CASTEL, chair of Alia Science Education Working Group and co-chair of the Scientific and Pedagogical Committee of UNESCO's Office for Climate Education. Whew, so you're very welcome. Next up, we have Dr. Anne Dolan. Anne is a lecturer in primary geography in Mary I, um, which is part of University of Limerick. Her edited book, Teaching Climate Change in Primary School, an Interdisciplinary Approach, was recently launched by none other than Duncan Stewart, and she's the author of Powerful Primary Geography, a toolkit for 21st century learning, as well as You, Me and Diversity, picture books for teaching development and intercultural education. Anne is particularly interested in creative approaches to geography, outdoor learning, and education for sustainability for all sectors of education. Anne and Kleena, thank you both so much for joining me this evening. Thanks, Sonia. Hi, thank everyone. You, Sonia. So happy to have you here. Um, I'm going to start off with a question for both of you. So jump in. Um, when did you first learn about climate change and how has your relationship with climate education evolved over time? Maybe Anne, would you like to go first? OK, um, I suppose in teaching geography, weather is a fundamental part of geography and climate has always been a fundamental part of geography. And for many, many years, I suppose the term global warming has been used and the whole idea of the earth heating up. But there was a kind of a resistance to using the term climate change. And it's only really in the last um, 10 years or so that there's been an explosion in the, in the term climate change rather than global warming. And when I was working on my geography, powerful geography book, I had this chapter on weather and climate change. And it was so difficult. To, to address it in one chapter. And I tried and I tried and I edited it and I tried again. And I went for a walk one day and I just thought to myself, it's impossible. It doesn't belong to geography. It's part of every curricular area. It has to be addressed right across the curriculum. So that's when I had the idea for my climate change book that I would bring other colleagues on board. And, um, it's funny when you have an idea and you share it with other people, you don't know how other people are going to react. So I sent an email to my colleagues and I said, look, I have this idea. Would you be interested in coming to talk to me about writing a chapter about teaching climate change through your discipline, whether it's through drama, Gaelga, literacy, RE, PE, whatever. So a lot of people came back and they said, oh, Anne, that's a lovely idea, but I don't know anything about climate change. I'm no good to you. So I said, don't worry, come along. We'll put a process in, in, in place. We will learn together. And that's exactly what we did. A small group of us gathered together and we started talking about climate change and we addressed what we didn't know. 
And we, we invited guest speakers, um, different experts on climate change came to the college. We met once a month and slowly people began to become more confident and they began to deliver the CPD themselves. But the interesting thing about it, there were conversations in the staff room. People were huddled around tables talking about climate change. So for me, that's been my journey. And, and the, 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 the final product is the, the climate change book. But just one, one little story on that before I hand over to Lena. I spent three years working on the climate change book with my colleagues. And I naively thought that as soon as the book was out, that everybody in Ireland would be teaching climate change. Of course, that is not happening. And when Duncan Stewart launched the book, he held it up and he said, this should be the Bible for every primary school teacher. So I'm hoping that the book will start a conversation, that people will start dipping their toe in the water and be open to exploring climate change in their classroom. Over to you, Cleena. I might just jump in before Cleena answers the question and say it's actually really humbling to hear you talk about your colleagues who are lecturers coming together and you know filling in the gaps in terms of their own climate education um I think it's a it's a really important story for primary school teachers to hear as well because um yeah like they would look to you guys as the experts so the fact that you all kind of learned together before writing the book is yeah I think it's really nice yeah. Um, but yeah, same question for you, Kleena. When did you first learn about climate change yeah. and how is your relationship with climate it's, change? It's a funny one because I was trying to think back when, you you know, to think about that question. And I was thinking, God, was it when I was a child? Or, and I can only think back to when, you know, the only thing of, you know, saving energy was, oh, God, did you leave the immersion on? Turn it off. Oh, God. <laughs> and then I suppose um, for me then, I suppose then when I started to get married and had my own house, it was all things like, you know, you'd be watching out for, you know, saving your energy and making sure the house is well insulated. And, you know, when my girls came along, it was, you know, don't be, you know, wasting the water and, you know, taking part, I suppose, it was more rather taking action than necessarily specifically related to climate change. I suppose my relationship with it was, I suppose, was more towards the sustainability and, you know, taking care of the future. Um, but then I suppose when you look at it in terms of my science education, then in this role, all along, I've, I'm over 20 years in education now in science education. So, you know, in showing, you know, looking at science education and how to teach about science education, particularly in primary context. And a lot of the content in the curriculum, you know, although it's not mentioned in the science curriculum at all, climate change, um, a lot of the content is directly related to climate change. So that, you know, way back, we would be lo looking at it through the physics, biology and chemistry. And then I suppose over the last, as Anne said, 10 or so years, looking at the, the science pedagogies in the context of sustainability and looking at the sustainable development goals and then looking at issues around climate change, renewable energy, etc. So I suppose it, it's all emerged, you know, and then as well as teaching and education now, obviously, that, um, you know, sustainability, climate change education is very much on the agenda. So recent research projects that I've been involved in is particularly exploring over the last 12 years, I suppose, looking at science education pedagogy in the context of sustainability, like through developing education resources um, developing um, professional development or professional learning programs for teachers. And then more recently, I've been exploring, you know, climate change content in, in, in science curriculum around the world as well. And it's interesting, and even just on that, and I will stop talking because I mean, you'll never get any further. But interestingly, as Anne said, you know, nobody knows what climate change was. Well, 10 years ago, it was global warming. And if you if you look at our primary science, our primary curriculum, which is under review now, as everybody would know, and um, you look at the science content, and in it, there is very there's, as I said, climate change isn't mentioned once, but the potential through our science education curriculum to address issues around climate change, there's so many. So perhaps something, you know, online at that for the next curriculum. So I better stop there. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think you're, um, you've kind of hit the nail on the head with a few things and we'll definitely talk about them a little bit more in depth um, as we go through. But um I think just to st take a step back, maybe for for some of the teachers um, logged in today, 
in the same way maybe they heard about global warming 10 15 years ago when they themselves were in college and now it's all about climate change like one isn't right and wrong they're both still very much things that they need to learn about and things they need to be teaching but um sometimes in our sector so in the environmental ngo sector we have um development education charities we have esd or education for sustainable development charities we ourselves always have said you know for the last 25 years we've been teaching environmental education informally not um through the school system outside of it um but and what what is the difference say between those three things or do they all kind of mold into one another um, yeah. and if you had to put yourself in one category what would that be that's an interesting question and I suppose my own journey reflects a move through those uh, terms uh, many years ago uh, when I was teaching I took a career break from my teaching and I went to work in Lesotho for two years so that was very much in um, I suppose as part of, of Irish, the Irish Development Aid Program. And I suppose that got me interested in the whole area of development education and what people in Ireland knew about. And at the time we were saying developing countries, now we're, we're saying more global south, you know, to, in terms of, of uh, respect and perspective. I suppose the whole issue of development education, I was ensconced in that for years and years and years. And the whole idea of knowledge, skills and attitudes, learning about injustice, learning about human rights and fairness, and also learning about environmental protection was very, very strong for me, a very strong sustainability element. So the whole terminology then moved to global learning. Now it's moved again to global citizenship education. So there's a very interesting, um, I suppose dichotomy is the wrong word, but there's a whole range of policies and reports on global citizenship education. And there's a whole range of policies and reports on uh, education for sustainable development. And I actually prefer the term education for sustainability, but that's another issue. And now the thinking is beginning to bring the two back together, UNESCO, um, there's a, a big conference coming in Dublin um, in December. A lot of the, 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 the thinkers at the moment are saying, you know, we need to support both education for sustainable development and global citizenship education. And the big policies. So, for example, Irish Aid have a lovely policy on global citizenship education. The, um, the Teaching Council, which brings out the standards for our student teachers in a document called CAME, they have now said that education for citizen for global citizenship has to be a mandatory part of teacher education for every student that includes education for sustainability on the other hand the department of education has just brought out a new strategy on education for sustainable development which they say includes education for global citizenship so you can see the two are really 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 intertwined slightly different spec depending on whose policy we're talking about so irish aid talk about education for global citizenship the department of education talks about education for sustainable development but for me the two of them are very much very closely aligned um, and i but i have come from i have come from a development route into the sustainability and i suppose that for me the two of them are, are equal now but that's been through my own my own experience Okay, yeah, very interesting. I, I need to reframe that in my own head from development education to global, global learning. Citizenship. Yeah, 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 yeah. Education for global citizenship. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, okay, cool. And Kleena, how does um how does climate change kind of um I suppose come in and out of all of these various areas of education? Um and where does science education fit? Yeah, that. and and I suppose um, we, from a perspective of science education, you know, my bread and butter, you know, is to teach the pedagogy of, you know, looking at science education. But more and more, we are teaching about this in the context of the issues around, say, sustainability and looking around, you know, climate change as well. So, like 
what we would be doing in our, in our workshops would be, you know, trying to have our, the aims of it would be try to get our students, student teachers and indeed teachers to understand the science underpinning some of the issues around sustainability, we like with biodiversity, clean water, you know, renewable, renewable energy, whatever, and climate change education. And we would, I suppose, set them a problem, get them to do science investigations to understand the science behind it. But then what we then, once they have the science, we're trying to look for their literacy to be able to take this science information and then, right, have a problem, look at a, a global problem, look at socio-scientific issues, look at some of the conversations around, you know, society, uh, when, when there's a problem. And I suppose to use their science knowledge, you know, to solve the problem or to be decision makers. So I suppose that's what we're trying to do, understanding the science education and using this for scientific literacy, using this to make sense of different issues. So I suppose that's where we would sit. And we often would, you know, afford our students after doing the science investigations or whatever, give them a problem and get them, you know, to assume different roles and um, to consider a, a societal issue and consider different different perspectives um, of, of different people, but use the science to make informed decision and to put form, forward, you know, an argument as such for the for um, to to make the decision. Amazing. Yeah, I think um, science education in particular in the last kind of five to seven years, we've seen such a big focus on the communication side of things. So, you know, the the area has always had incredible methodology and problem solving and exploration, um, but maybe could be said that kind of fell a bit short in comms up until recent years. Um, so it's amazing to see that in science education, um, you're kind of looking at some of those uh, like social, um, I suppose, like borrowing from the mm -hmm. social sciences a bit more. Borrowing but I think I think it makes sense. Uh -huh. Um, I think it makes sense for you because a lot of the issues, you know, if you're looking at denial, if you're looking at it doesn't affect me, actually understanding some of the environmental or scientific perspectives, you know, from the science perspective, it's kind of a good argument for, you know, to be making these changes to taking action. So I, I think it's important and we might be slow to the party, but hopefully if that's a probably a wrong expression, but hopefully we're here now and that we have a contribution to make. Yeah, absolutely. And even if we look at the third level, um, we were talking about master's programs before this webinar started. And, you know, a lot of the a lot of the master's programs now are incorporating communications and media studies with something like climate change. Um, so, yeah, that's that's really, really incredible to see. Um, and your most recent book has an entire section on pedagogies of hope, which I will hold my hand up and say I haven't had a chance to read yet, but I really want to soon, uh, maybe after Climate Action Week. It sounds like just the most lovely principle, one that I think we should all have. Um, but can you tell us a bit more about that and kind of what it might mean for a teacher in practice? OK, so I suppose um, there's a lot of talk about eco-anxiety and putting a burden on students. And many teachers say to me, I don't want to teach about climate change because I don't want to worry children. And I think that's not fair to children. I think um, we have to teach about the world that we live in, but we should not put a burden on children. This is not their fault. This is, is um, there's a way of teaching in an age appropriate way from infants up to sixth class, through secondary school, through third level, in a way that, that is um, appropriate, accessible, and honest for children. And I suppose, um, even in terms of, of being hopeful, um, psychologically, if, you're, if you walk into a room and you're full of despair as a teacher, that despair ripples through the room. If you have a bad day and you walk in and your shoulders are hunched down, you can open up page 10 of your textbook. That has a ripple effect and that's not helping anybody. And it makes everybody feel lousy, upset, um, browned off. But if you're upbeat in your approach and if you see the positive side of life and if you see people as problem solvers, you know, we can do something. 
the situation is serious, but we can all take an action. If we believe, and when, if we do take an action, that's very hopeful. That gives us agency. It gives children agency. There's so many things that we can do. So many things. And if you focus on what we can do instead of what we can't do, then we are making a difference. And that's all we can do. You know, we can, we can only make, we can make a difference in our own life. And we can hopefully influence other people in terms of making a difference. So that's why in terms of, of children, I think it's very important to give children agency, to allow them to voice their opinion, to facilitate them taking action. And my goodness, when they take action, that is powerful. Even simple things, um, for example, predicting the future, asking children, what do you think it's going to be like in 10 years time? If you're working with 10 years, 10 year old children, you know, it's 10 years since you were born. Let's think to the future, let's stretch our brains. What do you think it's going to be like in 10 years time? How will this place be different? And one very simple activity around that is to take a picture book and for the children to write the next uh, page on the picture book, to draw the picture, to write the text, what happens next? And the beauty of that is there's no wrong answer because we don't know what happens next but that shouldn't stop us thinking about what happens next so i think so much of the work we do with outdoor learning with engaging with nature with the the with, with infants just getting involved in the the awe and wonder and, and having that space for children to splash in puddles and to play with leaves and throw them up in autumn i think a lot of teachers do that already but that's a very important part of climate change education Teachers may not see it as such, they do it anyway, but sometimes it's, it's, an, it's, it's, it's all about kind of recognizing the bits that you do are actually very good practice in climate change education. So I think, you know, and this is where the science comes in as well, and the nature table that we used to have years ago, we need to re-engage with nature. We need to spend some time outside. Um, with COVID, there was um, an opportunity for people to go outside. It was healthier. People put on their coats and they went outside. We're kind of back in classrooms again. But even on a fine day, and I pass by so many schools and nobody's outside. There's so much learning we can do outside. We can learn. We can involve, get involved in problem solving. We can get to appreciate nature. Um, sometimes teachers are a little bit nervous because they don't know maybe a particular species or they say, I don't know, my tree. I'm not very good on my trees. Don't worry, don't worry. Let's look at the shape, let's look at the buds, let's get some tree identifiers, let's solve this together. So with the children and the teacher, let's see how we can figure this out. And as an absolute last case scenario, there is an app that you can use on your phone called Google Lens. And you can use that to identify your oak tree or your ash tree or your hazel tree. But that should be your last resort. Because if a child asks you, you know, what's this tree? And you say, it's an oak. You've closed down the discovery. You look at it and you say, oh my goodness, that's an interesting leaf. How would we describe it? What makes it unique? Is, can we compare it to any other leaf here? Let's look at our tree identifier and see if we can find it. So that sense of awe and wonder that infants have. And I think children tend to, to lose it as they get older. So we, as teachers, we need to reinvigorate that. We need to bring children outside, get messy with mud, have fun. And uh, there's just like, that's one of the beautiful things about Ireland. There's so many beautiful sites, whether it's a bog or a forest or a river or a field beside us, use that as a site to start off your global education or your climate education. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with everything you have just said. Um, and it honestly, like makes me so happy that there are so many students learning from someone like you um about kind of rediscovering that wonder and awe as adults um I think a lot of people maybe when they have their first child or their kids are toddlers and you know they're out in a forest they can find themselves rediscovering their love for nature um but yeah great to to get that done earlier um, I saw an article there about a month ago that said Ireland has the second lowest connection to nature in Europe, which horrified me. 
Um, so yeah, I think everyone here today can can maybe take that on board and tomorrow just go find some time in a beautiful place and yeah, just take a minute to connect. Um, Kleena, Alia's 2020 report um, on the climate change education in Europe, so you kind of mentioned it a bit in your intro, um, that is a report that I very often go back to um, when I'm developing climate resources as part of my job or doing teacher training for green schools. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that science education working group that you chair and maybe what's happening next or how people might get involved? Um, well, Alea is, um, it's the, the science education working group, is, it's, it's a mm -hmm. subgroup. And ALEA is, stands for the an, an acronym of all European academies. So representatives from all European cal, um, academies can put nominees on the working group. So I'm representing the Royal Irish Academy on it. And oh, I've been there for a number of years now, but I as, took on role as chair there about two or three years ago. And climate change education was something we were trying to look as a theme and we explore issues around science education. Like our whole thing is promotion of science education, you know, to ensure, you know, students and citizens throughout Europe, you know, have the knowledge, skills, attitudes, values to be scientifically literate students. And in part of this, we look, we explore themes. And one of them was obviously looking at climate change education. And in our conversations, we realized, you know, we're all doing um little bits and from the the different countries throughout Europe yeah oh, we're doing this and we're doing that and we realized you know there's not any report you know that actually brings all of this data together just to kind of give you a flavor of what are the you know, the trends the gaps you know the challenges with science education so we just um did a very small report a snapshot of about 40 countries or so just to see what kind of initiatives were, were coming on and you know what was going on so the report these are some interesting findings you know essentially you know a lot everybody's doing a lot about the science and you know about and, and the cause of climate change but a lot of the initiatives aren't looking at action and mitigation and you know it does appear in, in a lot of curriculum but it does appear that there's not a lot of support for teachers so some of the recommendations and that, that there's a lack of a clear framework for what an effective climate change education program might look at a primary schools or secondary schools so what we've done is made recommendations about what kind of supports are needed for teachers within educational contexts as well so the report was published and it actually is because we're looking at rather than the group is really to inform policy is to give it, you know, to put out statements like that. So we have done. So in, in terms of climate change education, we've the report is actually needed. We have to make a lot of responses to different um, governments, government and non-government organizations. And I suppose in, in climate change education for the group now, um, we're at a pause, not at a pause, but we're waiting for COP now and 27 to looking at the outcomes of COP, whatever, and we will make a response. In terms of what, how people can participate, I suppose uh, currently not really, but if you want, um, not so much related to climate change education, but we, the Royal Irish Academy and ALEA are co-hosting a one day symposium for teachers in October. Or what date is it? Is it October? I should know that, of course. It's Wednesday the 25th, month. is it? Yeah. And, you know, here we have international keynotes coming in talking about science education. And obviously we would be looking at um, issues around climate change and sustainability because this is the context that we're looking at those. So that's it. So there, there is a website we can I mean, share that just to look at all the, the different reports there as well. But I, I think it is. I I I I'll let you know. But it, it is. It's on the Royal Irish Academy's website anyway. But I think it is Wednesday. Is it Wednesday, the twenty fifth of October? Yeah, oh, it's it actually Tuesday. Yeah. yeah, it's actually the Tuesday. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. No, that is great. Maybe we'll pop a link in the chat for that. Um. Towards the end of today, and just to confirm, that is geared towards teachers. That is geared towards anybody in the in the field of STEM education, okay. and and the the it's not so much related to climate change, so I don't want to take up too much time here. But it is looking at challenges and successes in STEM education throughout Europe. 
So not necessarily related, explicitly related to climate change, but I know a lot of people in that area because there's a lot of people working in STEM education, exploring issues around climate change and sustainability. So I imagine some of the panelists will be looking at those issues. But um, it's free and lunch is provided, but you do have to register. <laughs> and it's actually Tuesday, the 25th of October, not Wednesday, the 25th. So Tuesday, the 25th, if anybody is interested. Yeah, I have the link somewhere in my email, so I can pop it in the chat later. Um, very good. OK, so we kind of touched on it a bit earlier. Um, as most of you probably know, the primary curriculum is under review. Um, and earlier this year, we held a consultation with just over 20 primary schools on centering climate action in this new draft framework. Um, we then made a submission to the NCCA on behalf of the Environmental Education Unit of Antashka and 11 education programmes, including green schools. Um, overall, we'd like to see a much greater emphasis placed on outdoor learning, connection to nature and climate literacy in this new primary curriculum framework. Um, we feel it is an incredible opportunity for Ireland to lead the way in world class environmental education, creating active global citizens that are truly connected and empowered for decades to come. So with that in mind, um, maybe I'll go to Anne first. What would you like to see in the new primary curriculum? Um, I suppose I agree with the points that you have made. <clears throat> I very much would like to see a strong emphasis on outdoor learning. I really, really would. Um, I think we have such a, a way to go in terms of outdoor learning. I, if you think of, if you think of the hand, heart, and um, hands model. So much of our education is focused on cognitive head stuff in the classroom, looking at screens, looking at books, uh, dealing with with concepts and knowledge. You know, what about um, our feelings, our emotional side, engaging our feelings, engaging our hands? You know, people say, how how come we're not changing our behavior and i think that comes down to education because education is very much geared towards the head and some of the work that i'm involved at the moment i'm involved in this model i'm trying to, to promote education that addresses the head the heart and the hands in the context of a hopeful pedagogy so i suppose that that would be my um recommendation but outdoor learning is the perfect scenario for that because straight away people are outside they're walking they're feeling they're touching um so they have the hands element but they also have a, a feeling i mean for example i brought a group of students to a, a local forest um monday evening and we were all tired and exhausted and a bit cranky and after two hours we left feeling fantastic just a simple two-hour activity in a local forest so it has it has that influence on well-being and it makes me laugh you know there's so much talk now about well-being and it's very, it's very easy to address well-being if you bring people outside more sometimes teachers will say oh the irish weather the irish weather and i always say there's no such thing as bad weather it's bad clothing so if schools <laughs> were to do simple things like invest in a set of wellingtons that can be left in the school all the time and um kind of wet suits wet kind of clothes and pull-ups that will keep the children dry and they're very very cheap and parents are happy to kind of buy a set and leave it in school and the children can have it all the time. So you're able to go out whatever the weather. And then to use the, the class, sometimes people think when, when I say outdoor learning, it's just sitting outside having a picnic or reading a story. Not at all. It's outside engaging with the elements, measuring rain, looking at nature, collecting data that you can use back inside for maths. So, you know, using it as a, as a lab, as a lab, using it as, as a way of collecting data, noticing the seasons and, and recording it. So sketching, taking photographs, looking at how the area is changing and using all of that as data that will inform your your geography, your history, your maths, your literacy, your Gaelga. There's so much that you can do. So I would like to see outdoor learning very strongly in the curriculum, but I would also I agree with you. I would also like to see climate literacy. I think because of the seriousness of the situation. You know, um, in, in 2018, the IPCC brought out a report that we have 12 years to take action. I mean, it's pretty serious. If you were to look at the, um, 
the maps that anticipate um, sea level rise around the coast of Ireland. Uh, they're, they're quite worrying and yet county councils still allow people to build houses in areas that according to science will be flooded in a few years time. So does this mismatch all the time? So I think climate literacy is a must, outdoor learning is a must. Um, and I think everything else that I would like to see would be a, an, an added bonus. I, I'm a little bit worried about all the emphasis and all of the resources that have been devoted to literacy and numeracy. I mean, the, the strategy was launched, everything and the garden sink was thrown into um, literacy and numeracy. I don't see the same pizzazz or the same investment going into outdoor learning and climate literacy. So I think now, this is be me being a little bit pessimistic, and I'm usually not being pessimistic, but we could be the most literate, numerous population as we fall off the cliff. So <laughs> let's get our priorities <laughs> right, and let's invest in climate literacy, in outdoor learning, so we as citizens can make changes, we can inform our politicians, we can turn things around. And if you think, like David Attenborough says, we're the greatest problem solvers, let's give people a chance to solve problems. And this investment in literacy and numeracy drives me crazy. But the other thing, the investment in well-being as well. I mean, well-being will come automatically if people are outdoors, if people are climate literate, if they feel that they can take action. But okay. sitting in a classroom talking about well-being isn't going to help anybody. I totally agree with you um in terms of outdoor learning like we've seen a massive uptake in green schools where um investment in outdoor classrooms is happening especially since covid um and you know in some green schools um where maybe they have support from the board of management and the parents association it's the most magical place um, where they have like a willow walkway and they're surrounded by young saplings and they have like rocks to turn over and bugs to explore and it's all just the dream. And then we have other kind of concrete jungles, <laughs> yeah. which are, you know, a, a poured concrete slab for a bench for the kids when they could just sit on the, the grass or, yeah, um, we definitely have seen a combination of both but at least they're getting outside a bit more which is great um Kleena what would you like to see in this new primary curriculum yeah like outdoors is a no-brainer um for me and that would have been one of the things but even just to comment I absolutely agree with everything Anne and yourself have said there but just for um teachers who might think oh you know we have this primary curriculum we can't just be bringing the kids out you know just to look at trees and have fun outside we have to get through all the maths english irish history geography curriculum but i would go the extra note to say you don't have to make a big deal about going out this is my outdoor lesson this is my time outside why not just say right for a bit of gaelga take the children out for five minutes you know, do a bit of and come in. So it doesn't have to be a big thing, you know, to, okay, this is my outdoor lesson, that you actually see it as a classroom and that you, you think of every subject that you do, you don't have to do the full subject outside, but dipping in and out. I know often, like if we were doing something, of course, with science, that we might actually, one of the workshops, we'd be getting the children to explore magnets or whatever. And, you know, we'd be giving them materials in the, in the workshop, you know, to see materials that are attracted to magnets. And then we say, right, let's go outside. It's mm. quite nice and see, and it doesn't have to be the big hole. This is my outdoor classroom, you know. This is my outdoor lesson. So yes, one hundred percent outdoor. But um, and I suppose I'm looking at this from um, one of the competencies on the a new primary curriculum is active citizenship, and that has to be welcomed. And they do explicitly mention, you know, sustainability. But you know, looking at climate and change, we we have to address that, and we have to look at science science literacy or climate literacy rather. Um, and I think that can be addressed in all the curriculum, um, in all the curriculum subjects. And it doesn't need to be a big, here's the science curriculum, a brand new, you know, strand unit on climate literacy, because there's too much in the curriculum as it is. But like I look at the primary science curriculum as is, there's no mention of, I think, Global warming might come up once or climate, but not climate change. Yet when you look through the content, there's so many. I started to talk about this earlier, that you could actually teach the science, do your investigations, whatever, as with the curriculum, but make the link to climate change. 
Hmm. So, for example, something you might be doing on floating and sinking, and you might be looking at properties of, you know, water and ice and, you know, looking at levels, you know, if an ice melts, you have a glass of water, you put an ice cube in, you know, what happens to the water levels, you know, will it rise or whatever, or, you know, as 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 the as the ice cube melts and then you know looking at that and then equating that with you know what's the difference is is it the icebergs melting that's causing sea level rising or is it land ice or etc so it, it's it's a very simple you have to do the science the investigation follow the science curriculum but why not go that one step further so in the new curriculum i would like to see yes do mean one through the science because i guess as Anne said you know numeracy and literacy we're all afraid about our subjects, but of course, to be an active citizenship, I certainly would more engagement in hands-on inquiry-based science, but explicit links in the curriculum as to how this is related, explicitly related to climate change, to some of the sustainable development goals, mm -hmm. so that teachers can actually make very simple connections here and raise awareness on it. Yeah, I... I... I'm really glad you clarified that because at the start I thought you were saying we don't need the explicit links. So yeah. I'm... Oh no, oh no, 100 <laughs> percent We don't want we don't want another, you know, teachers. There's so much on the curriculum. We can't keep yeah. adding onto the curriculum. We have to start, you know, reducing it and make it more impactful and you know, and more time for all these, you know, critical thinking, problem solving skills, but that we can do it in the context of serious issues like climate change, looking at it from the different perspectives. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's uh, my wife, for example, is a sixth class primary school teacher and has had sixth class for the last three or four years. Um, and every year we'll do kind of a week on climate change and they'll do studies and investigations and they'll do their own pro like it's very kind of project based learning. But the other sixth class teacher will never do that because she's not comfortable with the mm. topic and doesn't feel like she has the time to dedicate to it um, or maybe doesn't know how to kind of weave it into English and Gaelic and maths and that kind of thing. Um, so I do think those explicit links need to be there because we've kind of seen in green schools, you know, there's a cohort of about five percent of teachers who are able to feel like they can talk about climate change answer their students questions but unless those explicit links are made in the curriculum throughout those subjects if it's not going to be its own subject which we know it won't be um yeah though though it needs to be in writing that the link is there and it has to be made and talked about um, and i think educational resources can do this and you know i'm yeah. sure even you know i if teachers are given ideas and shown how this relates or how you could relate, absolutely, it needs to be there. Yeah, and we'll we'll share a couple of resources. Um, I'm just conscious of time there. Um, the fact that it is Wednesday evening, quite late, um, and really appreciative of your time and everyone that joined us. Um, so I might skip towards the end. There's no questions in the Q&A box, but if anyone here has a question, please type it in now. Um, or forever hold your peace. Um, I, I guess I'll finish up with, um, and if you had one take home message to primary teachers listening in this evening, what would it be? I would say um, inspire your students and be inspired by your students. Um, and I, I you know, I think there's so much possibilities as human beings. We're such we're so creative. The, the possibilities are endless. And I think see those possibilities. But I, I have a lovely quotation here that I'd like to share from David Attenborough. No one will protect what they don't care about. And no one will care about what they have never experienced. So I'll say that again. No one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they have never experienced. So for teachers, the challenge is to give children an experience of the wonderful outdoor environment in which we live. Through all the seasons, through all the weathers, um, the everyday outdoor environment, just enjoy it, use it as an outdoor classroom, use it as a place of learning, be inspired by it, and uh, 
inspire your students. That's that's my take home message. Amazing. And I think if they do that, it would also make their day job that bit sweeter um, for themselves. Yeah. Um, Kleena, what about you? What's your one? Yeah, well, I don't think I can put it as articulately and as poetically <laughs> as Anne did. But I would say the teachers are, are our biggest, our best source to make things happen. And they have an, a huge, significant role in supporting our children and inspiring our children. And don't undervalue what you can do and, and, and what you are able to do. Um, but one thing, I don't know whether this is, is poss possibly not answering that question, but I thought like with coming up, I thought for teachers, primary school teachers in Ireland, if you want to take an action, there is an opportunity coming up to participate in a teacher's cup coming up, for which is now in on in Egypt. And I'm not saying we're all getting flights to Egypt for a cup. But that if anybody is interested, the office for UNESCO's office for climate education, which is his is, is newly developed, is there about four years. They develop education resources for teachers on climate change, looking at professional learning, you know, trying to link collaborations with government organization and education institutions. But they are hosting a teacher's cop. So to participate in that online event that teachers in Ireland, they would love teachers from last year. I think they had 500 teachers from 35 countries this year. And um, they, they're looking to expand that. But they're looking and I was talking to them. They are looking for Irish teachers to share experiences of teaching. Maybe they, what they've taught are things they've done on climate change in their classrooms or have they developed climate change um, our climate change or climate resources to share. And if you don't want to share, I think the deadline for sharing is the 16th of October. But if you don't want to share, you can certainly participate and it's free of charge. And then I think it's the, the Friday or the, the Saturday before COP that Teachers COP is happening um, in November. But again, we can put in the chat there. All of the details are for the Office for Climate Education. And I think for teachers, Irish teachers, it would be lovely to meet other teachers across the world who are teaching climate change education, who are sharing their stories of what they have done in classrooms with children. And I think it might be very rewarding um, just to show how inspirational teachers are and what fantastic things they are doing. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. So I will be participating in Teachers Cop, um, you know, just to hear about um, all these experiences. Brilliant. Yeah, that sounds great. I hadn't actually heard about that before. So thanks for sharing, Kleena. Um, so a couple of comments and questions in the chat there. I shared the link for Alea's conference on the 25th. And um, so Kleena, maybe if you want to find the Office for Climate Education, if you want to find that link, pop it in the chat. Um, any other suggestions for outdoor learning for a sixth class group apart from the rain gauge and tree identification? Now, I feel like Anne might um, jump in here. Um, but yeah, for me, um, the most interesting thing in terms of outdoor climate ed that I've done with a sixth class is actually looking at adaptation um, and how your school might um, cope with things like storms. So my first ever climate action week six years ago was hit by Stormophilia, um, which kind of got that conversation started. Schools in the country closed for two days, others closed for longer. Um, I have a resource from one of our programs, Globe, that I'll share in the chat. Um, and I'll also send a follow-up email to everyone that registered, sharing all these links. Um, but Anne, do you have any um, suggestions for that teacher there? Yes, I, I have so many. I mean, that that's part of the problem. Um, one, I suppose I have at the very top of this chat, I have a padlet of resources um, that that's available for all of you, and it brings climate change through right across the curriculum, and it's linked to my uh, climate change book. And I suppose there's a chapter in this book on outdoor learning, but um, there, there are so many things, but even, even if you were to invest in a collection of small little magnifying glasses and to bring children of all ages out with their magnifying glasses and to notice, to look closely at different leaves, different bugs, bark, um, look at, say, even in terms of art, look at patterns, uh, use um, natural materials to make pieces of land art, 
um, bring the children outside and make a mandela. And the mandela is kind of a, a circular piece where you put start off with maybe a cone in the middle and you, you build concentric circles around and around and suddenly you have this piece of art. So you can use the outdoor for your art uh, for problem solving and I liked that idea you know even in terms of using the school grounds as a way for for adaptation or for mitigation for climate change so use your school grounds uh, for for problem solving some schools have uh, school gardens um, where they plant plant um, uh, uh, vegetables and that but even if you don't want to plant vegetables even if you have a box and plant um, uh, herbs Herbs grow very quickly and you can give the children the herbs to bring home. And it's just incredibly empowering for, for children to see. We grew this in school and we're going to put it in our stew at home. So if you're a little bit scared about vegetables or a big plot for vegetables, you know, start with a little bucket or a little box and grow some herbs and give the herbs to the children to bring home and see the reaction. And then you'll move on to your vegetables. I mean, but you can literally use the outdoors. As Tina said, you can be outside at Cancha Scuelga. You can do your orienteering and your PE outside. You can do your weather measurements and your, your climate discussions outside. And you can have a plan for the school and, and say, look, even in terms of planning for this village or this town, what, what resources can we use for, for protecting against climate change? So there's all kinds of creative things, but you can use the outdoors as a setting for a story. So you can bring in your creative writing, your drama, and you can have the school grounds as a setting for a mystery or a creative piece of writing or a drama or a climate solution you can really you know there's so many things you can do outside amazing thanks um we have one question in the q a so i think we'll answer that and then call it a night because i'm sure it's late yeah. enough and really appreciate everyone's time here today and um, so the question is can you explain the term climate literacy great question Probably one I should have started with. Kleena, do you want to take that one? Kleena, you're muted. Sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm busy putting stuff into the chat there for resources. So I suppose, what is climate literacy? I suppose a climate literate person, in my view, um, would be a person who has the knowledge about climate change education, who would know where to access this knowledge for climate, for climate uh, on climate and climate change, who would know that if they're reading um, an article or a science report or a, a feed on Twitter or a thing on Instagram, that they would know, they would have the, the requisite knowledge to understand, you know, to critique the article, to know, is this from a reliable source? If it's not, they would know where to go and look for um to 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 look for this um information to make sure it is reliable but it's also i suppose somebody is i suppose it's having the knowledge and the skill sets to understand and make sense of issues around climate literacy also looking in i think looking at in terms of having looking at values and the moral issues underpinning this as well so um is that it's yeah is that a long-winded way is it an articulate yeah, yeah. And not at all. Have you got anything to add to that? I think um, for me, maybe maybe this isn't um, climate literacy, but I know in our climate ambassador program, where we see a lot of people that maybe do have that um, education background and they understand climate change, but they're not yet um, comfortable or confident enough to converse about it. Um, so we would kind of sometimes bring that into it, but I suppose maybe that's not, um, maybe that's going over and above because that's more about climate communications. Um, but but yeah. I think even in terms of when we talk, I equate it with scientific literacy. Yeah. And if you if you have science, somebody who has scientific literacy has is a would be a citizen, a scientific literate citizen. So yeah. they have the knowledge, they'd have the skills, they'd have the values to apply it and to understand a, social, a, a science issue in life. So having climate literacy is looking at an issue around climate change, around adaptation that causes mitigation and having the knowledge and the skill set to make sense of that, perhaps to take an action or to do something about mitigation. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. And Elaine think Lenehan. Hello, Elaine Lenehan. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I know an Elaine, it might not be. Uh, I'm sure it is. Um, 
So just to wrap up there, I want to thank you both so much for your time. Um, I've been looking forward to this conversation for weeks um, and it didn't disappoint. So I really appreciate that. I've popped a link in the chat there for our other Climate Action Week resources. Um, and both Kleena and Anne have shared numerous resources as well. Um, there was another comment about if the recording will be available, it will. It'll be up on the Green Schools YouTube channel. Um, probably later this week um, and yeah happy climate action week please go and have a fabulous evening um, and I could just one say thank you very much Grania and I must say hats off to you what you've been doing this week for climate change through the education program is phenomenal and I've been dipping in and out of different events and it, like it, it really is amazing so congrats to you and i think you, you'll need a nice big break next week after all you're doing so thank you it has thank been so really inspirational yeah thanks Lena. i'm definitely going to take the midterm off <laughs> <laughs> i'd say so <laughs> all right good night thank you so much Brian. good night thanks, thanks okay bye. bye bye